over 20 years and you're still not guaranteed a tag, but came out here, had a great crew. Uh, I was just the shooter, did a, I did a fair at best job at that, but in the end, I think this is all that matters. The hunt we were on was on the famed uh, Kaibab Plateau. Everybody talks about the Arizona Strip. I'd be a fool to say that uh, I wasn't interested in that tag, but being several points behind Max, I knew that uh, the odds of me drawing it in my lifetime were slim to none. It certainly could have happened, but I really had to start thinking about uh, what the better probability of me getting a tag in Arizona would be. and that turned me to looking at the Kaibab Plateau and the tag that we ended up drawing. Being this late muzzleloader hunt in November, we were hoping for uh, some good rut activity. We knew there'd be deer transitioning uh, and the migration. Beyond that, I really didn't know what to expect. Uh, the area is beautiful. Uh, there's certainly areas that are different with regard to the big burns, and but then you get up into the Ponderosa Pines, and you know it's everything that you expect of uh, what a big mule deer hunt should be on the Kaibab Plateau. We brought some cold weather gear in this hunt. We knew there was a probability of some cold weather, but I didn't realize how cold it would get at night. I think the first morning that we woke up, which was opening morning, was about 14 or 15 degrees. Uh, we took off and got set up on gla different glassing points looking for deer, and I think it was about the third spot that we stopped at we finally laid some glass on, uh, on the buck that we would go after. When we first set up on the deer, they were moving down a canyon, so we made a move around them and kind of snuck in above them. And we knew the deer was bedded down below us in some thick stuff. And even though we were close, 100, 150 yards to the deer, because of the steep grade and all the locust brush in front of us and uh, how quiet it was, we knew getting within visual sight of that bedded buck was going to be very difficult. Had to make a call and, and move in and, and see if we could do it and hope the deer would stay put, but he didn't and uh, he kind of ran across the bottom of the canyon and came out the other side. On this hunt we were fortunate to have uh, several spotters in place to help us knowing that in this big burn you may not be able to see the deer from one angle or another angle. So in this situation, it was actually fortunate that one of the people that was helping us saw this specific buck go over the top of that uh, this long ridge and actually bed down in, in a thicket uh, on the backside of that, that, small, uh, that small ridge. So we made a move around and came in from a different direction and uh, worked in to get, uh, to get above the bedded buck is, you know, I would rather get within 50 or 60 yards, but we were able to get set up uh, at about 355, 356 yards, I think is what we ranged the bedded buck at. And then the wait ensued, and we sat there for a long time. I laid in a pile of uh, the ashes of a big burn log, and uh, I think we laid there about an hour, hour and a half. And, you know, there's different types of fatigue. There's fatigue from climbing mountains after sheep or... Uh, going on a long hike, and then there's f fatigue from doing absolutely nothing but sitting behind your rifle waiting for that moment when the buck is going to stand up and eye strain looking through the scope or the cramp in your back from trying to get in the right position. And I think I readjusted probably 35 times in the period we were laying there. After a while, that buck finally stood up and uh, I had the confidence in the gun and when he stood and turned, uh, I sent the round on its way and hit him a little bit high. It was a fatal hit uh, for sure. And that buck, uh, you could tell from the reaction and the fact that he just stood there, he really didn't know what had happened to him. In the process of reloading, the buck, uh, he started to move and he moved into a little bit of thicker stuff and we kept glass on him. He moved down, oh, 100 or 200 yards and he bedded down once and got up and then bedded down again and he was in he was in pretty bad shape. Uh, we debated just letting him uh, lay there and die, but again, you know, we were in, after we moved we were within range. I think we were about 202 yards from him and uh, I had a, a small tripod with me and we set the gun up on the on that and uh, 
put one right in the boiler room and the rest is history and it's kind of funny I don't even remember ever looking at that deer's antlers I remember seeing him facing me the first time we saw him but after that it was just a buck I was just I knew that that was the deer that we were after one of the people with us might say hey yeah he's bedded here or whatever but I never looked at his antlers and didn't really know the the caliber the or the beauty of the buck that that I ended up harvesting until I walked up on him and what a special animal it really was it's a almost like holy shit that here is big look at the droopers big bladed eye guards an extra at the base sticking out that's two inches long I cannot wait to hear your thoughts because I have my own it's a deer like 150 what's up 150 <laughs> Um, I'm thinking your math might go. He's deep everywhere. Look at those eye guards. Thank you, man. It's awesome. Congrats. Thank you. I'm right. My son Blaine, uh, who's now 23 years old, was able to accompany me on this hunt. He's been on a lot of hunts with me, and I've been on a lot of hunts with him. He started. Uh, going hunting, deer hunting with me back behind the house. As a little boy, I would go up and get in a uh, stand archery hunting for whitetails, and he would sit there with me, and that fostered his, uh, his love of hunting at a young age. And here we are, uh, his entire lifetime uh, of 23 years represents about the exact time it took me to apply and, uh, and, and finally uh, get this Arizona Kybet mule deer tag. So in a way, that's kind of a special... Uh, story or unique aspect of this uh, of this hunt and that how long it takes for these opportunities to actually come to fruition. I uh, came out here, had a great crew uh, working for me. I was just the shooter, did a, I did a fair at best job at that, but in the end I think this is all that matters. Uh, opening day of the Muzzleloader season out here. Wish I could, the hunt could have lasted longer, but I certainly won't turn down a deer like this on the first hour or the last hour or, or anything. So it's hard to be. Dream come true, that's for sure. I can't thank everybody enough. Well, as soon as that Kaibab hunt was over, uh, we had a few days to kill, but uh, we ended up packing up our gear and heading north up to the Henry Mountains. We met up with Landon Sorensen, and uh, we knew that he was the guy that, that knew the mountains inside and out. So we were excited uh, for the upcoming opener. It was hard to get sleep that night, knowing that in the morning we could be looking at, uh, at some of the big bison that live out on the Henry Mountains. We woke up, uh, oh, I think, 3.30, 4 in the morning, uh, got ready, met, the, met Landon out there, got on the horses, and we knew it was going to be a long ride. This time of year, the bison have been pressured from some of the earlier hunts and uh, are in areas that are, that are pretty uh, difficult to get to. So that's where the horses came into play. It's hard for us to prepare for such an event. I know Blaine, I don't think he had ever ridden a horse before, or at least a, a few times, but nothing to really... Uh, amount to what he was in for on that day. Well, here we are, uh, getting closer. I'm on Purdy the Mule, 30-year-old mule. Some people have uh, been applying probably since this mule was born. And I had a long wait, but not, not quite that long. Hopefully, uh, I've hunted bull bison before and never had a crack at one, so maybe today's the day. There's two bunches. We're going to go to the far ones. Huh? How do we get to them? We're going to try not to spook these, we're going to cut down and, and kind of straight out that way from them. We ended up uh, getting on the horses. We rode for oh, what must have been almost three hours. And we had an idea of the country that where the bison were, uh, were presently uh, kind of hiding out in. We started looking. We would just look over the different edges and glass, and we found a few uh, a few small bulls. But what we didn't know is that they were actually part of a bigger group. As we tried to circle around and put some glass on them to see if there was a, a shooter in the bunch, uh, the wind kind of betrayed us, and uh, then the the chase was on. And we had an idea of where they would go, 
uh, just from past history of Landon knowing that area the way that he does. We made a play to, to get to that area. Quite a long ride, or at least felt like a long ride when you're kind of disappointed thinking, oh, this day has turned sideways. And we rode up to a high point and then uh, crawled out onto uh, some of the big ledges up above to see if we could, again, glass some of these uh, this broken cedar country. And uh, I watched Landon out in front of me all of a sudden stop and said he's, he spots him and he can see him. And I thought that they were really close uh, by the way he acted, but they ended up being, uh, oh, seven or 800 yards away. The area they were in was difficult for them to get out of without coming you know, within six, 700 yards of us on the way out. And uh, there was no real good way for us to get in to where they were without uh, you know, scattering them like a covey of quail. And how do you pick out the one or two bulls in a group when you're looking at 20, 30, 40 bison in the thick cedar country? So it was really interesting and it was, it was cool. It made me think of uh, the, the old buffalo jump stories and uh, in my mind, I knew these bison weren't going to jump off of a cliff, but that's the area they were in. I mean, they were surrounded by cliffs all the way around them. It was a big area, so we kind of set up and watched, and uh, we were on this big precipice or pinnacle up above uh, where we thought they were going to uh, exit the area where they were bedded. And slowly, but you know, minute by minute, we watched the group, not running, but just taking their time and making their way, uh, I believe it was northward toward where we were, and it was really exciting. It's hard to put into words watching a group of bison like that as they made their way little by little. And you know there's maybe one in the group, maybe two that, uh, that, that you would shoot. So to pick them out and keep track of uh, that bull is hard enough and then keep checking the ranges and make a decision on when to shoot. We kept getting the ranges right off 800, 700, 652, 500, 475 and very unnatural for me to be dialing a turret down than dialing it up, you know, when an animal's going away and you're waiting for it to stop normally. In this case, it was uh, everything in reverse and pretty exciting watching them get closer and closer and closer. And I squeeze off a shot and uh, I'm the kind of hunter, I don't, uh, I don't let an animal get away when I can make another ethical shot. I was confident of the first shot and I'm confident that bull was gonna go down, but I certainly always follow up. I don't. I don't feel like uh, you know joining the rodeo. That was a saying I like to. I like to use, and I certainly didn't want that to be the case. So you can see we put that bull down. I believe it was the final shot, about 130 yards, and just an amazing hunt. Uh, the footage, uh, really, in this case, I think it does justice to the excitement level that uh, I felt, and I know my son Blaine, I'm sure, felt as well, sitting next to me and watching something like that unfold and. You can't not kind of reflect and think That's about you, you know the history of the bison and some of the early hunters, be, whether they be natives or uh, you know the, the Europeans uh, in the 1800s and how maybe they had hunted them in the past and get a little bit of a feeling of nostalgia thinking back that it's kind of cool knowing that truly wild bison in the Henry Mountains, the descendants of those last remaining bison up in Yellowstone. Uh, that they're still running wild in the in the mountains of southern Utah and even for a brief moment that I get a chance to experience a little bit of uh, maybe what some of our forefathers experienced uh, many many years ago. The old, uh, the old buffalo jump, we were on it. That's pretty cool. That's the way I like to do it. It's like hunting whitetails, you know, from up above. Awesome. Thank you. It looks like it. Congrats. Thank you. Hell of a hole. Yeah. <laughs> we had a great crew out here with us. I know I couldn't have done it myself. And when you see how well these horses work and land and his family and crew and uh, just you, you realize everything that goes into a hunt like this coming together, they make it look easy. And uh, I just felt privileged and a true honor just to be a part of it let alone be out here with these uh, magnificent animals, descendants from uh, final bison left in the United States in the early 1900s in Yellowstone National Park. It's pretty interesting history about these animals and these are the great, 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 great grandsons of those bulls from over a hundred years ago.
Heading out into day one here in the Henry's. Couldn't get any better than that. Uh, it's everything you dreamed of. I mean, you see from the vantage that we were on and just watch them coming toward us, whole herd of bison, and it's, uh, and you couldn't, you couldn't draw it up any better than that. Just a fantastic day. Beautiful ending to a great day up here in the Henry's. It was really cool to have the opportunity to tag along on a couple of truly iconic western hunts. You know, a lot of people, when you think of hunting out west, you'd think of that big mule deer. And obviously, you know, a bison hunt is probably the most iconic western hunt that I can think of. And to have the opportunity to be present on two of these amazing hunts was something that I was really looking forward to. We were fortunate and we harvested that bull on the first day of the bison hunt, so we had plenty of time ahead of us to get up into the mountains and try to get out into that snow and cut some big lion tracks. And I have actually never seen a mountain lion before, so every time we would slow down and look at a track, my heart would start racing and I would be thinking, man, is this going to be the moment where everything just breaks loose and we start to get those dogs collared up? and start to try to run one of these lions down. As time kept going on, I kept thinking that, uh, you know, it wasn't going to happen that day. The, the sun keeps rising higher. It snowed the night before, the wind was blowing. After several hours of riding around on those snow-covered mountain roads, we finally cut a nice mountain lion track, and everything started to get real when we opened the boxes and those dogs piled out, and we started getting the collars on them, and as soon as we got the collars on them, we rolled up and turned those dogs to us, and immediately those dogs started hooping and hollering. And it was unlike anything I had ever experienced before. My heart was racing the entire time. In the back of my mind, every step we took, I knew that it, it could be one step closer to a lion. And uh, CG finally said, I think this cat's tree, it's time to go. Let's go get us a lion. We started trudging through the snow and you know this snow is a lot deeper than you you think it is at times it was up to my knees and I'm trying to keep my footing I'm grabbing onto trees and I'm slipping around like crazy but that's definitely part of the fun of lion hunting out here is experiencing these these rugged mountains and this incredible terrain we were starting to get close to where we could hear the bellowing and the barking of the dogs and you know I'm I'm super fired up at this point I I did I can't even tell you what was going through my mind Unfortunately, right as we were starting to get to the point where I'm scanning every tree, expecting to see that cat any minute, uh, the dogs started getting further away from us, and our guide told us that that cat jumped the tree, and we were expecting the day to get a lot longer at that point. Fortunately, that cat didn't go too far before those dogs caught back up to it and baited up in another tree, which ended up being a really tall ponderosa pine on the edge of this steep canyon. My heart was pounding. I, I could feel my, my heart rate in, the, in my ears at that point. And uh, I mean, the excitement that you feel from those dogs, it's, it's completely contagious and infectious. And the energy that they put off is unlike anything I've ever experienced before. And that cat finally took a step up a little bit higher, gave me a little bit clearer of an angle. I flipped the safety off and started a slow squeeze on that trigger. And that 300 PRC barked. Yeah, it's amazing that a cat living out here in this country can live so long and create a life for itself hunting these, these big game animals that it hunts out here. You know, being that it's not some massive 500 pound lion from Africa or, or a big tiger, tiger from Asia, but it's just a hundred and some odd pound cat that's living up here in these mountains. And the skill and, and uh, the prowess that they must possess to be able to hunt the animals that they do with the level of success that they do is beyond me. It's amazing to think that these cats are living up here and that there are so many of them that are able to live the way that they do and hunt the way that they do. Being able to share these three amazing hunts with my father is something that I'll never forget as long as I live and to be present in these amazing areas. I mean, the Kaibab is such an iconic location, and the Henry Mountains, that speaks for itself. And then to chase cats up here in these rugged Utah mountains is a memory that I'll hold on to for as long as I live.